So on behalf of the director of the John D. O'Brien African American Institute, Dr. Richard O'Brien and his staff, welcome to the Scholar in Residence Brown Bag Speaker Series. I am India Lord Wilmot. The Scholar in Residence Brown Bag uh, Speaker Series was developed by Dr. Richard O'Brien, Dr. Nakisha Cody, and myself in an effort to increase the opportunity for students, faculty, and staff to network with one another and to engage in scholarly discourse and conversation. Today is the third of such events and many more to come. Use this one. The scholar residents in the series are supported by friend and colleague Dr. Nicole Aljo and the Africana Studies program, as well as the Department of Cultures, Societies, and Global Studies. For your support, we thank you. I'd also like to acknowledge the personal support of Drs. Gordana Robrenovic and Maureen Keller, who provided a lot to me while I was serving this role as scholar residence. I'd also like to thank the Institute's graduate students, Danzel Jones and Janelle Agnes, Angus, for their love and support. Yes, <laughs> um, And also for my lovely husband who surprised me here on Valentine's Day. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> so today's panel, Sarah Bartman, Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and The Booty, Black Womanhood, Sexuality, and Beauty in Pop Culture should be fun intellectually stimulating and engaging, and what an interesting topic for Valentine's Day. Right. So before proceeding, I'd like to open the space with two quotes from African-descended women poets. These are about love. The first one. Claim it, all of it. Release what no longer serves you. Journey forward. Be unanswered. Be unapologetic. Love yourself anyway. Be you, love you, always, always. And that's from Alexandra L. And the second one is, here you are, black and woman, and in love with yourself. You are terrifying. They are terrified as they should be. And that's from Upil Chisala. So without further delay, I'm honored to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Moya Bailey, who will facilitate our discussion. Dr. Moya Bailey is a black feminist and critical race scholar writer, activist, and assistant professor of culture, societies, and global studies, and of women's gender, women's gender and sexuality studies right here at Northeastern. Notably, she coined the term massage noir in 2008 to describe a specific form of discrimination and anti-black racist misogyny experienced by black women and then for popularizing the term in a 2010 critical essay entitled they aren't talking about me, on the Crunk Feminist Collective blog. Moya's scholarship focuses on marginalized groups' use of digital media to promote social justice as acts of self-affirmation and health promotion, as well as the ways race, gender, and sexuality are represented in media and medicine. Currently, she curates the hashtag TransformDH Tumblr initiative in digital humanities and is the digital alchemist for the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network. Her first book, co-authored with Sarah Jackson, Brooke Foucault-Wells, titled Hashtag Activism, Networks of Racial and Gender Justice, is available March 3rd on MIT Press, so you need to run out and get your copy. Her second book, Transforming Misogynoir, Black Women's Digital Resistance in U.S. Culture is forthcoming. 
So without further ado, Dr. Moya Bailey. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for bringing this weather to uh, Friday. And also Valentine's Day, no less, uh, to come out and hear our fabulous speakers and hear them in conversation on Sarah Bartman, Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and the movies, Black Womanhood, Sexuality, and Beauty in Pop Culture. As my students know, Sarah Bartman was part of an indigenous South African community known as, known as the Khoisan or Khoi Khoi. After being stolen from her land and only finally laid to rest there in the early 2000s, I'm reminded of the indigenous people of this land on which we speak. We are a land traditionally stewarded by the Pawtucket, the Massachusetts, and the Wampanoag indigenous communities that remain vibrant today. As we discuss the ways that stereotypes impact the lives of black women, we should not forget how stereotypes also impact the first stewards of this land. I'm gonna take a moment and introduce each of our esteemed panelists, and I will do so in alphabetical order. Uh, first, Dr. Kenitra Brooks, Kenitra is the Audrey and John Leslie Endowed Chair in Literary Studies in the Department of English at Michigan State University. She recently completed the Advancing Equity Through Research Fellowship at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Kenitra specializes in the study of black women, genre fiction, and popular culture. In particular, her monographs, Searching for Psychrats, and Psychorex Stars examines the treatment of black women in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Also, Kenitra is known for teaching an upper level college course on Beyonce's groundbreaking audiovisual project, Lemonade, which explored the theoretical, historical, and literary frameworks of black women, or of black feminism, that received local, national, and international press coverage. From that, Kenitra co-authored with Camila Martin an edited volume entitled The Lemonade Reader, Beyonce Black Feminism and Spirituality, which was published in 2019. Can you give a little wave, Kenitra? Oh, <laughs> Dr. Natasha Gordon Chipman Mary. Natasha is an independent scholar in Costa Rica whose work focuses on slavery. She's also a contributing writer for the Tico Times and Essence Magazine, book editor for Afro-Latinos, and author of the forthcoming historical fiction novel on the Black Madonna. Her book entitled Representations in Black Womanhood, The Legacy of Sarah Bartman, which seeks an alternative Africanist re rendering of Bartman's life on the ways black women are displayed and represented across the world, was recently recognized and adopted as a seminal text required for universities across South Africa. Thank you. And my students actually read the introduction to that book, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> Dr. Janelle Hobson. Janelle is Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality at the University of Albany State University of New York, also the chair of that department. She is a scholar of multiracial and transnational feminist issues. Specifically, Janelle's work examines the intersection between black women, history, and iconography across the diaspora. A frequent writer for a host of blogs and magazines, including the African American Intellectual History blog, in this magazine, Janelle is the author of books, Body of Evidence, and Venus in the Dark, Blackness and Beauty in Popular Culture, and a co-author and co-compiler of the Hashtag Lemonade, a Black Feminist Online Resource List with Jessica Marie Johnson. Thank you, Janelle. And of course, the reason we're all here Dr. India Lorik Wilmot. India is the inaugural scholar in residence at the John D. O'Brien African American Institute and senior lecturer 
of Sociology in the College of Professional Studies at here at Northeastern University. She is a social researcher for research centers, nonprofits, and foundations in the U.S. and Canada and the Caribbean on issues relating to race, ethnicity, identity, gender, American immigration, and social policy. India is the author of two books, Creating Black Caribbean Identity, which was rated a recommended read by the Association of College and Research Libraries, and Stories of Identity Among Black Middle Class Second Generation Caribbean, Caribbeans, We Too Seeing America, published in 2018. India is currently working on her third book, a digital media project tentatively titled Journeys of Belonging Blackness, and is the host and producer of its accompanying YouTube channel and podcast series called Talking Journeys of Belonging to Blackness. Thank you, India. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Geronda Miller Bryant. Geronda is an educator, director, and community advocate who has been making strides in higher education and nonprofit management for almost two decades. She is the director of Engaged Scholarship and Global Outreach and co director of the Young Women Leaders Program at the Maxine Platzer Lynn Women's Center at the University of Virginia. Her scholarship and community engagement work includes topics and issues related to black womanism, financial literacy, social justice advocacy, and community outreach. Thank you so much for being here. So I wanted to get this conversation started with what brought us all here today and the fact that this is kind of an extension of the conversation that you had on your radio show uh, podcast, Tuesday's Tea, where you had a conversation around these topics, uh, the history of Sarah Bartman and how she connects to Nicki Minaj, Beyonce, and the movie. Boiled her skin, got her skeleton, chopped up her genitals, her braids, put them in formaldehyde jars, and she was on display at the Museum of Man in Paris until the 1970s, when she was then put into the basement until Mandela's government in, in the late 1990s began to negotiate with the, with the French. Um, I'm going to add to what Natasha talks about. Um, um, I too have written on Sarah Bartman um, in my book, Venus in the Dark. Um, I devote uh, the first three chapters about that history. Uh, what I really appreciate about Natasha's uh, book is the bringing her within you know, the context of South Africa, because that is such an important perspective and it was lacking because uh, even in terms of my own work I'm, I'm operating out of a Western you know academic space so I think that was really so important um, but I also wanted to um, to make some commentary as well about that historical context because um, what Sarah Bartman and her history and the imagery that came out of that history um, it, it's 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 really important for us to keep in mind how um, I argue actually in my book that she serves as a kind of nexus between um, these two impulses that was happening at the time. So Natasha mentioned that um, in Britain they abolished the international slave trade. Um, and that's what, it, it was the trade, not slavery itself, because that was still happening in the Americas. That didn't get abolished until 1834. Um, but it's interesting though, because you see this shift that's taking place, at least within um, Brit Britain, Great Britain, from slavery and the slave trade to colonization, and therefore making these efforts to then colonize the African continent. And what that uh, ban on the international slave trade does is, one, 
It then puts the impetus for those slave traders and slave owners in the Americas to then shift from trading to breeding, force breeding. Uh, so then you need a narrative that makes it okay to perpetuate that. So you need this idea that something about these enslaved black women is not quite human, it's not quite, or that it's okay that we're breeding them because they're hypersexual anyway. And we needed that image of the hot and top Venus to justify that. And then on the other end, with the colonizing of the continent, you need a justification for why Europeans can then go into you know, African countries and colonize these people because they're savage. And so it's okay. So Sarah Bartman's history is about justifying those two impulses that's happening at that time. And I also think it's important for us to keep in mind that this is also during, um, Natasha mentioned, um, George Cuvier um, is the Surgeon General to Napoleon. So it's, this is the Napoleonic era where he was defeated, you know, when he tried to uh, conquer Haiti, when Haiti, you know, is able to um, seek independence for their island. Um, he's trying to reinstitute slavery. Uh, actually, he did reinstitute slavery once, once he came to power. So there are these ideologies that are in place where they need to kind of like re-justify, okay, Haiti, those savages, and which is what they were saying, you know, we can't let this happen. We can't let more um, enslaved people actually uh, gain independence and rise up and rebel. All of these um, impulses are really kind of coming together. I think it's interesting though, whereas with Britain, you know, they focus on this whole moral debate about whether or not we should have someone like Sarah Bartman, you know, be on display because that whole courtroom drama was about whether she was held against her will as a slave or not. Meanwhile, France, when she gets to France, their focus is on the scientists wanting to determine if she's human or not. Uh, and, and I think if you think of the cultural context, um, those particular conversations would come out of those very specific local concerns. So I just kind of wanted to add that because I think that history um, is, is worth keeping in mind. And, and also it goes back to what Natasha talks about with regards to why you would then have a post-apartheid South African government. Um, under Nelson Mandela's uh, leadership saying, okay, we want Sarah Bartman back and we're going to push forward. And yes, <laughs> there are now other uh, countries that are trying to get their artifacts back, you know, from the rarest museums. So we're starting to see that movement too. I think that's such a great point and it takes us to this question of how American culture specifically draws on Sarah Bartman's history and other representations of black women in terms of the stereotypes that get promoted. And so one of the things we've talked about in class is the evolution of uh, some of the stereotypes from perhaps the Jezebel to the Manny's to the Sapphire and the strong black woman and thinking about how there's an impetus at the beginning for the Jezebel in terms of the breeding program that you're talking about, but then a move to the mammy once uh, slavery is abolished, and now we need to imagine that black women are no longer desirable, no longer needed. So I was curious if you all could talk about how these stereotypes are still operating. Do you see them in conversation with uh, Sarah Bartman and also some of these other people you've named? Uh, Nicki Minaj and also Beyonce. Mm -hmm. so. so I think for me, when I when I you know, reflected on your question, um, both prior and then also sort of following up to Janelle's commentary, I I find it helpful to be able to contextualize that within the framework of white anguish, right? Because 
you know, I think that at the time where, and Natasha and Janelle, you both just spoke on it in the sense of, all right, there's this whole notion of we're going to um, talk about her, whether she, Sarah Brown, in terms of the context of being a slave or not, right? And I think that that white anguish comes, up, comes into play when we start to talk about the fact that people are really questioning how is it that they're viewing non-white bodies or physicalities. And then you sort of drop that within the sort of context, too, of the actual circus shows that she and other hot top Venuses um, were subjected. And in many ways, that's entertainment. And entertainment really requires a dissociative engagement, right? Because you're not a part of that process, right? So you can pull yourself away, right? And then in doing so, you can see that when you see these bodies, then it can in part release you of your guilt and your anguish because then you can dehumanize, right? So that's, so that's part of how is it that we come to the narrative, right? And the justification because if in my anguish I just take a step back and say, oh, well, you're not really people anyway, right? And then, so therefore any degradation, any humiliation, um, it's not seen as inhumane because guess what, you're not really human, right? And so when I think about it like that and fast forward to why, you know, the kinds of tropes that we exist, that we see existing today um, in the United States, you know, that whole notion on scientific racism that Sarah Bartman is perhaps, or, you know, that missing link between ape and human, we see that fast forward where if you are a thick woman, you have to, in many ways, conform to um, rigid politics of respectability, which is the mammy. And if not, then you're the gentleman. <laughs> it's like the binary of either or, right? And that the hypersexuality that comes out of that is then rationalized to say, well, that's just in your nature. It's biologic. Um, and then as a result, then, well, African descended women are not fully human because we don't have a full range of human emotions and experiences. And guess what, we don't feel pain. We don't experience trauma, right? And furthermore, we're not even deserving of love, care, and adoration. So when you have that dissociative existence and process, then you can have these tropes, you know, running wild and carefree to describe us and frame us in our existence. Um, May I um, interject, uh, particularly as India has fast forwarded more to my contemporary <laughs> area, um, so much of this has me thinking of the current conversation around Lizzo, mm -hmm. and particularly the anti-black, I mean the anti-fatness that's um, included with her massage Um and the idea of what bodies get to be sexual, mm -hmm. um, the desexualization of fat black women as well as um, the right type of thickness. And I think we need to continue to keep that aware because you can be thick, you can be fat, but only in very, very specific ways. Mm -hmm. Your waist still needs to be small and narrow, and then your butt and your hips can be big, and your boobs can be big, but your stomach cannot. And we have to talk about that sort of, um, not the impossibility, but the difficulty in not just achieving that status uh, when it's not quote unquote naturally born from you, but also in sustaining that status that brings in idea of age, that brings in the idea of, you know, bodies before children, before, you know, things start to, to drop. So we have to um, drop, <laughs> we have to um, bring all of these things in conversation but, but, but also the backlash of, I think we're talking, and, and I like that India began with this um, continuous idea of self-love. And even though some of it, it can be constructed in our entertainment um, venues, we do have to have this conversation about someone with the sort of positivity and you know almost consistent positivity of a Lizzo. And what does she mean for white audiences? as in ability to show that, you know, fat black woman and the safety they're in, because clearly, you know, your boyfriend don't want her or your girlfriend doesn't want her, so she's not a sexual threat 
to white women, but as well as how um, anti-fatness and phobia fat antagonism um, has deep roots also within black communities and how there has been this pushback against her, uh, not only her fatness, but her happiness and her positivity seen as um, there was a, there was a, um, twit, a tweet that went um, viral saying that, you know, Lizzo is um, the kind of chick that sings at, you know, all white venues. So she only has white audiences and all these things. When Lizzo herself had recognized this and said, like, this last album, the one that blew up, she's like, I made this because I'm not seeing enough black people in my audience. So someone who has that sort of self-awareness, um, not that she is a perfect construction or a perfect figure, but I do find it interesting as to these conversations she starts. Um, you know, that's why I find uh, Beyonce and Nicki Minaj and, um, and Megan Thee Stallion not necessarily just in who they are, but the conversations they bring up within and um, outside of uh, the black community. Um, oh, I was going to make a comment back to the history, but I think that is, I can also connect it back to what Kenitra addressed in terms of the fat phobia, because obviously um, the whole show, the whole circus around the hot and top Venus is about her being too much. So there has always been that negativity around taking too much space. And so being big, being thick, um, is then turned into the monstrosity that Natasha also mentioned as well about the Hot Top Venus show. Um, I, I'm thinking also um, the question, Moya, that you raised about how do we go from the Hot Top Venus to the stereotypes um, affecting African American. I'm actually thinking of the direct line between um, George Cuvier, who dissected Sarah Bartman, who happened to be the teacher of a scientist named Louis Agassiz, who then takes those ideas to the antebellum plantation in South Carolina. And then he makes similar um, scientific arguments around racial inferiority and savagery and hypersexuality. So, um, what I find interesting about racism and just misogynoir in general is just how very easily it travels across borders. And so it's not a huge leap, basically, to think about how did we go from the hot and Venus to the Mammy and the Jezebel, because um, those particular um, white European perspectives were traveling, and they were making those same judgments across bodies. So it's not surprising that then we have this fallout where it then trickles down to how we think in terms of um, uh, black bodies today and how there is still that historical echo uh, that, that resonates from these earlier time periods. I mean, we think we've made progress, but there are always these ways in which we keep going back to that. Um, but I, I do appreciate um, Kenicha bringing up the example of Lizzo, because I actually was thinking of, um, when you were talking, I actually thought of how um, some folks on Twitter were trying to claim her as a mammy. <laughs> And there was this whole conversation about, but Mammy's supposed to be, you know, without a sexuality. Lizzo obviously has one. So what does it mean to even project something that is completely desexualized onto her, other than the fact that she, you know, is, is, is a bigger woman, right? So even then, we're still kind of projecting a certain stereotypes that don't always fit, or, or even fit at all, right? And that was Azalea Banks. Right? She's not always a good source of, you know, she's the one that brought up the Lizzo and Bambi, so, you know, I just want to place that in Well, that's true, but there were other people who jumped on that bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> and Azalea, Azalea called her the millennial Mammy. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, she did make that, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's quite distinction. May I jump in? Yes. Oh, okay, I, I think there's a little bit of a delay, so if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I was thinking about what Janelle just mentioned about how these particular stereotypes about Sarah Bartman's sort of nose 
no geographical boundaries. And I think one of the things that I always wonder in my lived experience now is how this sort of this 19th century woman um, sort of becomes this very much like catchphrase for black womanhood in many in, across the board. And I always wonder about intentionality, right? That people people co-opt her or understand her within a slavery context so in the, the United States. They take her very much out of her South African context. And it's actually her South African context that created the, the situation for her, right? If she wasn't Poisson, it probably would not have happened. She, the story would not have been the same. But I think back to this experience of this episode in Sweden in 2012, where there, uh, an Afro-Swede was invited to create a, a, a cake for this big exhibition in Sweden. And you had all these ministers there. Uh, but basically what he did was he created a cake that was supposed to problematize um, the, the, the issues around female genital cutting. And he creates this black cake with a red body, but he, he positions himself as the head of the cake in blackface, even though he's an Afro-Swede. Um, and they called it the hot and top Venus cake, right? And so there's this whole performance when the minister um, comes in and slices the general areas of this red and black cake and feeds the cake into his head as he's sort of moaning in performance. And you know, I mean, there was this huge uproar about female genital cutting, his insensitivity. But for me, no one questioned the fact that the cake was called the hot and hot Venus cake. Sarah Bartman was not a circumcised woman. She was not someone from a community that practiced circumcision. It was completely out of her cultural context, but she's sort of the sound. It's like hot and hot Venus. We're gonna just throw this, and there's a, an association with permissiveness over-representing or in our, uh, misrepresenting black womanhood, silencing, violence, all these things get thrown on with this label. And I think it's, it's, incredibly, uh, it's incredibly dangerous. And one of the things that's really important here is that what I've noticed is that when people are trying to have different kinds of conversations, they're moving away from the use of the hot and hot Venus into the name Sarah Bartman, which is the anglicized name of Saki Bartman, the woman that we've been speaking about, right? Um, and so, and which is what her community in South Africa recognized her. They use the word Sarah Bartman. That's what they called her because they do not know her point of name. Um, but I think it's really interesting that people are trying to separate the performance of the hot and hot with Sarah Bartman, the woman. And I think that we need to be much more intentional and, and about how we apply our understanding about Sarah Bartman, the woman. That's a great point. And it kind of brings me back to this question about Beyonce as somebody who is both the person and an entertainer, performer, who has been taken up in a lot of different ways. And I think one of the things that we're wrestling with in the class is how do we think about Beyonce? Is she very much subject to or playing into some of these stereotypes? Or is she in a position of challenging them? And I don't, I imagine it's not a zero sum game uh, that we can see instances of of that happening in, in multiple ways, but I'm curious about how Kanitra, Janelle, Dronda, all of you are thinking about Lemonade as a place where some of these questions about the representations about black women are being explored, whether successfully or not. Mm -hmm. I'm actually thinking um, your question reminded me of back in 2016, before she released Lemonade, or even before she released Formation. Um, there was this huge um, headline um, in the tabloids that suggested that uh, Beyonce is set to star in a movie about the hot dog fetus. I don't know if you all remember that. But it... What struck me about that is, um, one, that they released that particular story on the exact 200th anniversary of Sarah Bartman's death. So I'm like, whoa, this timing is just so uncanny. 
So there, it's a bite. It's, so it's. It's Bartlett's Bicentennial, and we have this story running. Um, and it was so viral that so many people had opinions about it, both in South Africa and in the US. And um, Beyonce's PR team, they got on the story. And rather than condemn the idea that, no, this is not happening, they basically issued a statement saying, no, Beyonce is not doing a movie about um, the hot top Venus. But she, you know, we do believe that story needs to be told. So I thought that was an astute response, you know, coming from her team. And it also, I thought, um, prepared us for the more political, politicized work that she was about to unleash later that year. Because that happened a whole month before we got formation. And then we also have um, Lemonade, obviously. Um, so I'm sure we had different ideas about Beyonce and how she performs because she's very much about a kind of self, you know, she does these self-portraits around her booty. Uh, she's very proud of her booty. She works very hard to get that booty. Um, and, and we've seen how she's presented in some very interesting ways. I think if you look at her career, there has been an evolution in the way she thinks about these issues. I think that she has um, become a lot more thoughtful about how uh, her body is on display, which I think is, oh, I think there's a world of difference from Beyonce when she was doing Bootylicious to Beyonce doing Lemonade. <laughs> and, and so much of that we see in the way that she's self-consciously presenting her body. We can, we can argue about whether or not we always find it empowering or not, because then everyone is like, okay, and my, my booty doesn't look like Beyonce, this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is interesting because even Beyonce's booty doesn't look like Beyonce when you realize what she's doing in terms of getting it in shape. And you just need to read you know, her various perspectives to realize that she has to work at getting that, that, particular, that particular look. So I, I think we can go back and forth in terms of, you know, is this empowering, is this not? Is she reinforcing certain beauty ideals? Um, does her booty, is her booty okay because she attached to that as someone who's also light skin, you know, that there's a whole uh, racial hierarchy that's set up where she can benefit. I actually see her image as conflating, especially when she does the blonde hair, I see her conflating both a kind of all-American white blonde ideal married to the black bootylicious ideal. So she can bring those two racial um, aesthetics together in a way that doesn't look incongruous. And not everyone is in that space and in, in that position to do that. Thank you. Um, to put things in, in conversation to build upon what Janelle's been speaking about, I, I think it's necessary, and thank you for bringing that up about the different fiancés. We have to remember we met her when she was 50, and that now she's almost 40 year old woman. And um, I do think we have to continue to have conversations about who we allow to grow, and who we allow to mature, and who we allow to expand. Um, and I do think we can hold all of those things in tension, Moya, um, because uh, Tanisha Ford talks about we need to, a different, we need a different type of way to talk about Beyonce. Um, she, and she talks about it in the reader, but she also begins to expound on this Beyonce, the individual performer. And if anyone went to the formation tour, do you guys remember that she had, it was her, and then she had those big old cubes behind her. And um, even in some previous um, performances, she began replicating herself, right? And we saw many different versions of Beyonce's moving and behind the actual Beyonce. And before it talks about how there's the individual Beyonce and then there's the Beyonce machine and construct. And we have to be able to sort of, um, sort of ungrade those together so we can have more nuanced conversations about the different Beyonce. Um, and as well as building upon what Janelle said about the blonde hair. And um, Ford talks about her specifically playing with this construct of white female beauty in very, very intentional ways. 
And looking at women in the fine arts, we saw that in the ape shit video, right? Where you see the Mona Lisa, you see all these beautiful ideas of what European art um, is supposed to be, what it looks like, and how it has gone through time. And of her, problematically or not, bringing in and making it more black woman specific. Um, of having that conversation and of pushing the boundaries there. I think that um, it changes with how successful she is, mm -hmm. but I do think in having that conversation, that it's, it, it, and particularly within the communities beforehand, not in academic communities, I love seeing y'all, but also in communities outside of academia and in the larger black community and um, beyond, that we have to then give her the credit that's due with expanding those conversations. And I'm glad Kanitra um, made that point, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about what she said about thoughtfulness. Um, and um, I'll just say this, by having had this conversation uh, with India and then in the show, there was so much that I had to think about and had learned about how these things are connected and how um, we have to be really thoughtful and conscious about the images that we see and the images that we perpetuate. But then it also made me question, um, when we talk about thoughtfulness, how people in these positions, and I know it's one of those things where I do want to put this much pressure or this much responsibility on these icons and these, these people who represent our entertainment, but the consciousness that they have and how they might be perpetuating um, these images and you know how we see ourselves and so um, one of the programs that we work with um, in, in my work, my line of work, um, is a program that produces or tries to communicate body positivity. And that is seeing yourself in a way that is you know, acceptable, that is um, valuing the things that you come to the table with, the way that you were born. And um, I always struggle with that because like Kanitra was saying, you know, there's this idea of like this white woman's beauty and how we compare ourselves to that. But yet there's this also this line of, you know, you see women who are white, who are icons that are also trying to get the bodies that black women generally have. Um, and so I, um, with this idea of body positivity, we have to be really careful because what they're telling us is beautiful. Um, or they'll say, think, well, you know what, don't, don't comment on a person's beauty. Don't comment on how she looks, talk about you know, uh, her acts and her deeds. But black women generally have an issue with not hearing that enough. Right? So it's not affirming for us to say, hey, yes, it's great that we're smart and that we you know, can contribute to our communities, but I also believe, having had a little small black girl, that you also have to tell her that, yes, you are beautiful just as you are, not just when you have the proportions of you know, big breasts, small waist, big butt, but that however you show up is how you show up, and that's valuable. Um, so these are things that I've been thinking about because this isn't my scholarly work, but I've continued to learn and just kind of turn these things over. And for me, it just raises more questions. Can I so, also bring up an, an important interlocutor that we're, we're missing is Josephine Baker and how she and Beyonce specifically and repeatedly um, uh, gives homage, copies, etc. her and her own feelings about her you know, her asking her ticket, which she said, you know, and the capitalization of black women's bodies, and also with the Nicki Minaj, the stallion, um, also these conversations about what happens when black women th themselves capitalize off of their own bodies. And I think that's a different conversation and the nuance we need to bring, because a lot of folks have made money off of black women's bodies. So how then we do? How then do we have um, a complicated conversation about the politics of Black women capitalizing off of their own bodies? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you raised that, Kenisha, because that's what I was sort of thinking about the fact that, in many ways, and this is my viewpoint, <laughs> but that um, you know, take Nicki Minaj, uh, Megan the, the Stallion. In many ways, they are co-conspirators to the same oppressive systems that we're all fighting against, right? And I think in many ways, capitalism does help to aid in that co-conspiracy, 
right? And then at the same time, we can then turn to say, well, you know, when we look at their music videos and we listen to their music, you know, yes, in part there's a reclamation, and then there's, and then also the images are subversive to the narrative. But it's interesting because it's also reifying the same patriarchy. And so when I think about, you know, more recently the hybrid the Jezebel Sapphire, right? So not only do these tropes are oftentimes are presented as, you know, oh, you're either Mammy or Jezebel. I'm even thinking that we have hybrids of Jezebel Sapphire. So take Megan Thee Stallion. She just dropped a single called B-I-T-C-H, right? That's right, nod your heads, because I know some of y'all already <laughs> listened to that. <laughs> right? And in many ways, like the sapphire and the trope is, okay, that's the angry black woman, the strong woman, right? And the sapphire is, the, I mean, the Jezebel is the hypersexual. But here she is in this new song that just dropped. And you would think by her image where she's embracing all her bootyliciousness, she's embracing her sexuality, she's promoting it. And then what does she say as part of her reclamation and subversion? She says, quote, I'd rather be your B-I-T-C-H because that's what you're going to call me when I'm tripping anyway. Right? That's part of her lyric and her hook. Right? So what she's saying in that moment, right? So she sexualized, she's an angry black woman, but yet all of her songs, just like, you know, Nicki Minaj's songs are about, I'm using men um, in an exploitative way because I only need them for one thing because I'm that bad B. Right? But at the same time, I'm going to tell you that, well, I know you already didn't call me out my name, so I'm just going to then claim it. Like, that's, I mean, that's not us as an us, but like, that well, is I'm, the I'm whole thing. As a person of loving ratchet and et cetera, <laughs> 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 you're forgetting our own pleasure within, because no one gets me shaking my ass at this moment like I'm making this step now. <laughs> Young, who's right down the street at Harvard, she's at the Hutchins. And what she is looking at um, in her new book is called Whole Theory. And she is looking at the whole of the commercial sex worker as a politically insurgent member of the black community. I want to make sure that we are not denigrating pleasure, ratchetness, class politics, because all of us sitting up here with PhDs. Um, and we got we got to deal with that as well as the um, not that there's perfect perfection there, but we we have to complicate this because I don't want them denigrated or shaking their asses. Sure. Is that the only group of us? No. But I do think it's sort of problematic for us to say, oh, they shouldn't have this part of themselves. I think it's better for us to say there must be. A more of a multiplicity of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's better for us to say that we should have um, a Megan Thee Stallion and a Dej Lowe or, or um, all of these other things rather than castigating only those women because I think that's a power dynamic that we're not fully or always understanding or being sensitive to. Mm -hmm. Now, are they participating in that capitalism? Sure, definitely. But I also think, you know, a lot of us are co-conspirators here. We sitting at, a, at Northeastern University and using their money. <laughs> no, no, and so I guess I'll be clear, and no, I agree. I guess what I'm talking about, I should say I guess, what I am talking about is the fact that, you know, maybe it's the frameworks in which we're, some of us are using to counter that. Mm -hmm. Right? So, for example, I can't help but to think about Orgy Lord, right? When she talks about the, the actual utility of using the master's tools, because you'll never really get to go far at all. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you want to be able to see the change that you want to see, mm -hmm. right? And so, my critical eye is not to say that as full human beings, mm -hmm. that African descent and other brown people and just people are, like, we have the, we possess the power to be able to have and experience pleasure and love, but just be conscious of the fact that, well, 
what are the frameworks in which we are privileging to in terms of our own expression? Like, it's a, at least for me, and maybe I'm not articulating it very clearly, but I see it nuanced in the sense of you're countering a framework that has been used historically to oppress you, but yet you want to be free in that system of oppression. Well, why not break the chains of those frameworks and employ something else? Well, you know, um, uh, Kanisha brought I know that's so philosophical. We well, got no, like 20 I, I, I hear what you're saying, but um, Kanisha brought up Murray Leung, who, who has a really great book uh, called A Taste for Brown Sugar. She looks at the history of black women in pornography. And I think it, one of the points that she raises in the book is we always start from a place where to be sexual is to be negative. So as soon as we see the rep sexual representation, oh, this is a problem. Why? What's the problem with sex? You know, and, and if we actually ask that question, so what's what exactly is wrong with 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 sex and sexuality? Well, we can certainly point to a legacy involving um, in, involving you know images like the Jezebel, the hot and tough Venus. Um, but then we also need to deal with that gaze that created those images to begin with, as if they were a problem. And I think we we kind of have to free. We have to free that, that, that ideology in and of itself. It's like, can we step back and think about, maybe we need a whole different way of thinking about sexuality, so it's not always a negative. Because I think we tend to go into, oh, we can't, we can't have twerking, That's, you know, that makes us look bad. Look bad to who? Have we, have we asked, <laughs> who does this look bad to? Uh, and, 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 and whose gaze are we still valuing in terms of, we can't do this because they're gonna see us in this way. I think we do have to get into you know, some of those, those issues because, you know, I, because yeah, getting back to what Kanisha said, it's like, and uh, that idea of we actually have to think of um, what is erotic pleasure, what is sexuality, and um, uh, one more thing I will also say is, just like with Beyonce, I think a lot of these pop stars and other and rappers, they are playing with the available images that are out there. And sometimes you kind of have to engage with the image first before you can start thinking of doing something else. Like I really believe Beyonce's self-titled album had to come first before she could use Lemonade. Because, you know, those images from the Beyonce album, she's really playing with a lot of those very conventional portraits of sexuality. And then she does something completely different with Lemonade, right? So sometimes you have to kind of like get right into it and engage it, or even call yourself a bitch, uh, to get into what your anger is before you can then offer something new. I just think that sometimes um, we need to think about, well, what exactly is problematic about this thing that we think is a problem? I appreciate that so much. Oh, go ahead, go ahead Natasha. I, I'm sorry. Um, I think one of the things that Kanitra mentioned, which is really important, is this idea of capitalism, right? And so I think, and what India is talking about in regards to sexuality and sort of what's problematic, I think particularly if we're looking at the experience of, of Afro-descended women in the United States, we used to be the currency. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, the entire society was built on our bodies in terms of reading and sexuality. So if you begin to monetize sexuality, then it really sort of limits it within a sort of very patriarchal, capitalistic way of how one sexuality can be articulated. And so I think that maybe we need to rethink our own sort of spiritual and almost genetic relationship with currency and capital because we used to be that and then we used to produce that for other people in terms of their wealth. Um, we need to reconceptualize our, our sexuality in, in healthier ways that are wealthy but not necessarily always seek to monetize our sexuality. Right? Because it, if, it's, if it's not monetized, um, it, you can find other ways of entertainment, but if it's not monetized, the way that you articulate your sexuality, um, it doesn't have to be the only thing you go to because that's where the money is. Even though historically, we understand that that gaze does create capital. 
right, particularly in certain body parts. But I think we need to just separate or begin to ask questions about our relationship with money and how that's deeply attached to the articulation of a healthy sexuality, because there's nothing wrong with sex. Very well put. And I just want us to think about that also in terms of Beyonce and Jay-Z as you know, these new billionaires. What are we saying about what we want from black people or black celebrity? Do we want to be part of this billionaire class and be the new capitalist? Are we also asking questions about what we need as a community uh, that goes beyond capital and how that money is made? Uh, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions from, from the audience. So at this point, if you have questions, thoughts that you want to bring now is now's the time. The floor is open to you. But I also just want to thank our incredible panelists for such an amazing, amazing conversation. And when you think of people like Beyonce, and I think she's she's being very uh, being bold, or she's using um, her talent in a particular way, and it's up to people to sort of interpret it, what you can't you can't um, tell someone how to think about something. It's based on their, their knowledge and their upbringing that they're going to interpret it in a particular way. And in terms of whether we use, whether they're using um, their bodies to, to make money, uh, I think that this is the talent that they have and they're using it in a particular way. Um, there's certain things that they may do that People may look at not being right or, or the way they're doing it is not being right. But it's up to us as individuals to, to have our own moral compass and to determine you know, what is right or wrong. money off of black women's bodies, and then you went into the fact that we used to be the currency. You talked about how black women's bodies were in produced capital, so when we ourselves monetize our sexuality, we in turn reinforce the tropes of the Jezebel. My question to you all is what do we do about that? If I do want to, and don't mean me as the um, specific, yeah, I mean the general me, what do we do when we want to monetize our bodies without reinforcing that trope of hypersexuality and of this idea that we have to be viewed just for sex, but how do I still take control of that? Mm. I, can, can I also try to complicate it? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, am I talking? Yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Um, because I do want to make sure we hold space for commercial sex workers. And um, a space that is nuanced, and a space that is generous, and a space that is uh, caring. Um, and I think it's about um, having the conversations that Janelle put forth about removing that gaze. How are you working um, with your own sense of pleasure and what brings you pleasure and the work, the internal work it takes to do that. Um, and to take those gazes and other folks' gazes off of what brings you to orgasm. And I think that's just hard internal work that a lot of folks don't want to have the conversations about, but there is work being done with that. Um, Joan Morgan's doing work with that. Um, there's uh, pleasure politics. There's all sorts of things that are going on and having these conversations of, of how do black women find, find pleasure, have multiple orgasms, but also removing this idea and the shame around it. 
I, I, I want to um, also follow up with um, what Kenitra said about holding space for commercial sex workers. I think in general, um, we need to kind of reevaluate um, not just pleasure but work, <laughs> um, because you know, Natasha reminded us that yes, our bodies was the currency that was the capital that built the wealth of this nation. Um, and there is something very subversive when you do see popular black figures becoming billionaires because they weren't supposed to. You know, that there is this, and they're doing, they're becoming billionaires off of their own talent. This is not hereditary wealth you know, that other people um, are able to basically acquire and then build their capital from that. Uh, but if we think about our bodies, um, especially if we're gonna look at the legacy of slavery, if we think we have a right to our own bodies, we have a right to the autonomy of our bodies, and yeah, we have a right to actually earn whatever um, economic potential there is to that body, then we can actually make demands where we might be able to shift from capitalism to something else, where then it is about, uh, yes, women, all women need to get paid for their wage, for their, for their housework, for their childcare, not just sex work. Um, we have been so conditioned in terms of the gender divide to totally not see anything that women do as, as being worth being paid. Uh, to, to be paid, let alone to be paid well. <laughs> and, and, and we may need to make some real hard choices about how do we how do we shift the idea because I'm not completely, you know, on the, the bandwagon that all capital apo, capitalism is 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 negative for the community. I'm not even sure I would even say those who are self-made millionaires are necessarily capitalists, because I also think that certain conditions have to be in place in terms of being able to control the means of production, right? Uh, so we can think about what does wealth mean? <laughs> Yeah, where we don't want it to just be concentrated to just the handful of people, but you definitely want to see that that's something that could be um, distributed. What does that look like, and what does it mean uh, to imagine that all of us could actually benefit, <laughs> um, and, and, and to be able to benefit from whatever the, 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 the labor that we're providing? So I just wanted to kind of mention that too. Um, my question kind of goes back to what you were saying about this, and I always like to think about it on an asset-based lens, um, and I do think capitalism affects and maybe makes it a little harder for um, people, but uh, what Beyonce is doing, what Nicki Minaj is doing, um, are using the tropes against them, and like you were saying from the Pope of the Stallion, to um, almost code switch physically. So if Beyonce wants to enter a space where she chooses to be overly sexualized, she can do that. If she wants to wear a three-piece suit and button up all the way to her neck and be taken and testify before Congress, she can do that. And there was recently an episode of Blackish about black hair and how it can be anything that you want it to be. So thinking about uh, that aspect of uh, black female sexuality and for me being very light skinned but slightly dark, people automatically think I'm a good dancer. So I can twerk all day long and no one thinks that's, um, that's weird or out of place. So isn't that an asset, right? So knowing the stereotypes and tropes that are held against you, whether it be a Jezebel, whether it be a mammy, you can use that to your advantage to enter different spaces and appear as a mammy, appear as a Jezebel to your advantage. Economically, or otherwise. Well, then that speaks, at least for me, that speaks directly to what Orgy Lord was saying, right? So, you know, in terms of if the master's tools are those tropes and stereotypes, yeah, she's not saying that people don't use them, right? And that's sort of the ways in which, whether we code switch or just how we engage in identity performances daily. You know, whether it's by gender, whether it's by race and, you know, not to pick on you, but like you are lighter, but you know, and maybe in certain communities, you could be white passing, right? But then what does that mean in terms of your relationship in that space and how you negotiate? You know, the, on, the only critical part about Orgy Lord's critique is that that can only take you so far, right? In terms of if the end goal, and it may not be the end goal for everyone, but if the end goal is to bring about social change, 
then that's not going to push that along the way. But that's not to say that people don't do it. And you know, you have the flexibility of these kinds of um, fluidities and performances. Um, it might be a digression, but um, that was this woman's question. For some reason, I could not help but think about the movie Monsters Ball. Oh, yeah. Right? So Monsters Ball was um, Halle Berry and Billy Bob Thornton, mm -hmm. right? And if you haven't seen this, it's a little bit of an older movie, so you should go check it out. But there's an interesting scene in which, you know, everybody was like, oh, <laughs> 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 that we're all talking about, right? And how the, the imposition of that gaze, I think is what limits the flexibility and how people use these tropes to subvert and to even still feel empowered, right? Because Halle Berry, you know, she won the Oscar for that scene. Um, and, you know, one discourse around that was that she, it was something that she needed to express physically, mm -hmm. right? And for some, that was a, a space for her to have, you know, to go through whatever range of emotions that her character Leticia experienced. Mm -hmm. But what that also meant for some people engaging in discourse around that movie was, again, in that white gaze, it was about white redemption for Hank, the character. It was almost like her process in terms of her sort of experiencing certain things sexually and emotionally in that scene was also about him releasing guilt, right? His character's guilt and his, and, the, and, and his character's son's guilt around perhaps the death of her husband, right? So it's, it's this didactic sort of interchange that happens at the same time around these frameworks where it can be empowering. It was empowering for her character, right? <coughs> and depending on who's gazing, it, it redeemed him. You know, but again, it's these tropes that we're using, and that it's like my my sort of criticism is just I would want there to be a space where, and to your point, you're like sometimes you have to kind of be in it before we can transcend it. I'm like, can we transcend already? <laughs> can we be in that space? But you but you mentioned the gaze though, and um, I I think about whatever it is you do, that gaze controls you know, how they interpret what it is you do. I'll just give you an example. I mean, you couldn't get more respectable than First Lady Michelle Obama, and yet you did have, if you remember, during the course of um, the Obama years, you've had conservatives and various, you know, opponents uh, try to sexualize her, uh, make comments about her big booty. I mean, there were all of these things that they did, uh, and they were just making those comments just based on her physicality. Uh, so it's like, well, you can't really control that gaze because that gaze is racist and it's misogynist. Uh, so are we supposed to try to cater to that <laughs> or are we going to do our own thing and, and walk in our own truth? I do, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about, yes, the gaze controls and we need to think about how do we transcend that, but sometimes we also need to recognize that gaze is just there. <laughs> um, you know, the, 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 the way that... Even someone like Barack Obama, the way he was seen as this dangerous uh, socialist, is like, what, where? What, what are you seeing? I mean, it's not even there, but that can be projected onto you, even if it's not your reality. Um, and that's just, you know, what I think is what happens when uh, racism, and in the case of black women, racism and misogyny, or misogyny, um, this is what happens. It just, it just, totally reframes you, even if it's not who you are. And so this idea about how do we transcend tropes, how do we transcend, sometimes it's not about transcending, you're walking in your truth, realizing other people are gonna project that on you, but let's see if we can build ways to just, you know, you know, just send it back. It's like, this is not me, I need to, I need to, I need, I need to transcend that, really, more than anything. Can I, can I say? I, 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 I
I just really, really, really quickly, I know you are waiting, but um, I think that's one of the things I find the most interesting about I, the question, like, how do we get past this? How do we transcend is, honestly, conversations, and I know it sounds a little cliche, but, like, one of the most beautiful things I think about, like, hearing our show and having us, having people feel like they're sitting in a living room listening to us talk about these things and dissecting them and deconstructing them is that I think slowly but surely people can see that we are more than, like, you know, feeding into capitalism, which I know it's there, but we are humans who have a way of thinking about this, who have rationale. I personally would love to um, see how Nicki Minaj ra rationalizes the way in which like, she performs and how why she's done all this with her body, as opposed to let's just say, well, you know, it's gonna make her money. I, I think having these conversations and really just kind of listening to the rationale that we, um, have amongst ourselves as black women, as people who have, are, you know, are receiving the gaze, like having us under, having people who see us understand, like we think about these things and we're not just, you know, victims to it. We think about it and we have a way of like combating it. I think having that be a bigger conversation eventually will, I think, change the narrative at some point. I'm sorry, but I think there are ways perhaps to transcend, transcend the gaze, particularly, um, because I think that you may be able to find some room to navigate and then turn it on its head. So for instance, when she this, um, the previous uh, question, she was talking about her skin color, so she brought colorism into it. Um, while I'm certain that many black women navigate the angry black woman trope, I think it lands heavier on darker black women. Mm -hmm. And given that, I wonder if there is more room and ability for darker skin women to be more aggressive in the workplace without the same kind of retribution because they don't have to navigate the same beauty politics that white women do or lighter women do. Mm -hmm. um, and that gets, so I think about myself, I have had a, a major ascension in my career and I've also pushed a lot, but I recognize that when I push, most people have the expectation that I would push because of the way that I look. So I don't necessarily get a lot of, I mean, I, I get negative feedback for pushing, but I also get that I have this space to advance in a way that I've seen some of my counterparts, either they're not doing it as intentionally and they're not thinking enough about it, or um, they just have to navigate a beauty politic that I clearly can't navigate. So I, I don't try to do that. So I think, I, I share that because I think there is some space within these tropes that we can actually, that can be like breathing room for us to advance um, if we look at them beyond them being something that's oppressive. Before you answer, I think given time, you should take two, we have two more. 
the last two questions. Yeah. Can we just hear what the questions are okay. before the panelists respond? No problem. And can I please say something about Beyonce's Solange? I just wanted to, not now, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, you are beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's number one. I think um, women with blonde hair, with big butts, with big breasts, with light skin, with dark skin, I think we have to stop. Um, categorizing ourselves and recognize that we're still in the fight for freedom for ourselves and I think so many of these young women are um, moving in the right direction. Um, I think that there were a lot of stereotypes that were placed on um, black women as um, throughout slavery through the Manny system, through the Jezebel system, through the Sapphire. And I think that we have to recognize that those were things that were forced on us. They weren't um, um, positions that we took willingly. But young women today can more willingly, I'm not saying completely willingly, they are more, they more willingly, they can determine um, the steps that they're going to take in terms of liberating themselves and their bodies in whatever skin color we're in, whichever body size we're in, and um, we have to encourage and support that from the, uh, not just telling our children that they're beautiful, but helping them to navigate a system so that they're able to find the peace within themselves, regardless of what the sickness is that's going on outside of ourselves. And last question. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, could you or anyone speak to the idea that there is a filter or a narrowing of the number of people who can serve as models. So as I was uh, hearing you speak and what you said, it uh, resonated with me. And I also was thinking, uh, to the extent that you can advance, does that preclude other people from also doing the same thing? Because in a white space, they might say, oh, we'll choose one person and they can move up, but we can't have five people looking like you're doing the same thing. So if y'all can speak to that. And then also, I just thought about Eve a lot and wondering, uh, where she would fit in this space as somebody who was um, modeled sexuality in a different way, and I think received a different uh, was received differently. Why don't we start? Can I just jump in really quickly? Yeah, I was going to say start with Natasha, then Kitra, and then the folks here. So I haven't lived in South Africa for a really long time. However, the two things that come to mind in regards to Beyonce and Jay-Z. Um, one, I know that a lot of South African, I would say specifically black South African women, um, they understand Jay-Z and Beyonce not necessarily as uh, people who have a connection with them based on their Africanness, but they understand them as sort of very hyper wealthy um, Americans, right? And so there's not necessarily a kinship, but I know a lot of women uh, talk a lot about manipulating their bodies in ways that could look like Beyonce, and they see her as sort of a very interesting uh, beauty ideal. So there are, you know, particularly in universities, girls take pills, they want to have, you know, the, the weaves, et cetera, et cetera, in that way. The other thing that I know a lot more about is sort of the negative aspects of co contemporary conversations around Jay-Z and, and Beyonce, but I would say Beyonce specifically because she has recently really been in, engaged with um, having Afrobeat and different types of African music in her in her contemporary music because that's sort of where the direction of music is going right now. Um, particularly the work coming out of Nigeria. And so she has left really dirty taste in a lot of the amount of 
South African musicians who, and because I'm very, I'm, my husband's a, a Southern African musician, so I'm sort of privy to this, there's been a lot of conversation about exploitation, about music that has been taken, people have not been compensated, but people are sort of, they will jump on the bandwagon because they hear her name and they want to be sort of part of that particular uh, train that's going. But in many ways, there's also a deep distrust uh, because they have not been acknowledged, recognized, uh, but, their, but their art has been sort of taken and compromised. And so that's the only thing that I would say right now, right, those are the circles, artistic circles that I'm hearing regarding them and sort of her reaching into Southern Africa or even Africa in general and, and absorbing some of the music that is very much being created in a different world that's not looking for a US lens, it's not looking for a Western approval. What's happening in Nigeria, what's happening in Ghana, what's ha I mean, that stuff is just, that's the next train that people should be looking at for real. And that she's jumped on, actually. <laughs> um, I'll jump in about uh, Solange and uh, Beyonce and a little bit about Eve. So, I think we have to look at the, the very compromised view of Beyonce that we're allowed to see so that other people can have certain freedoms that she finances. Solange's music, Solange's artistry, even though they are sisters and share a lot of the same ideas, Solange is able to be Solange because Beyonce pays her bills and pays for her artistry. And I think we have to talk about and deal with the realities of multiple folks who are, and you know, this is family, et cetera. I don't think it's exploitative or anything like that, but Mrs. Tina's finding her freedom and getting um, her father, Matthew. All of these people have allowed to sort of be their true selves. And there's been a lot of conversation even about Blue Ivy, uh, of Beyonce wearing weeds so she could have her hair however she wants. But we have to have this conversation about how we aren't allowed, or purposely so, I think, to see Beyonce's true self in a lot of ways so other people can have those freedoms around her and that she cares about. And I think that has to be held in tension. I, I, they do come from the same house. And I do think that, I, I, to give her some generosity, I do think Beyonce has some of those ideas that Solange does. They're just very, they, they, they have a very close sistership, et cetera, these sorts of things. But, you know, Solange exists because Beyonce can fund her with the bullshit music that she made money with from Bootlicious. And we gotta talk about that sort of dynamic there, as uncomfortable as it is. I think another thing with E, we talk about Beyonce and Rihanna, Rihanna, cause she did so many albums and stuff, about that's a huge span of her career. Eve came into the game very much protected by um, the Rough Riders crew. She had a very masculine energy, so she was able to very much ride this sort of sexuality but being protected by, you know, she would refer to herself as the pit bull in the skirt and all of these things. And then she moved into more acting. She buried her career and she's pretty much stepped out of a lot of her career besides like she's on that um, daytime talk show. But she right. pretty much changed the angle of where she could be because she couldn't have been a rough rider forever. Um, we have to talk about that dynamic as well as who she married, what the emphasis of that is. She married like a German billionaire, billionaire, et cetera. And so she was allowed a financial freedom that a lot of folks did not have. She got her a rich white man. And when you got a rich white man paying your bills, you're able to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. Was that what you said I was fired to? <laughs> no, I don't think that's necessary that we should be fired to. Um, um, well, you know, I, I think those are really important points um, that was raised by both Kanisha and Natasha, so I'm glad they, they did, you know, touch on, you know, how we look at Solange, how we look at Beyonce. I'm actually thinking, you know, even before Beyonce and Jay-Z, does their video in the Louvre, Salon already did it at Guggenheim. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's, there is, I think they are sharing um, certain artistic 
um, ideas. Obviously, they're in the same family. I, I also have heard of the, the the conflict with someone like Beyonce appropriating, you know, African culture, as it were. But I do agree that Afrobeats is where it's at, and why she has actually, um, I I think, jumped on that particular train because I think she's projected. And one thing I will say about Beyonce is she's always forward looking, and is. God, she's really got this keen insight into the next big thing, which is how I think this is how she stays ahead. Um, it is problematic, and I think the, the point Natasha raised about um, African-American artists, uh, we do come from that space of US privilege. Um, we don't always talk about it because we tend to think of our experience in America as one of oppression, but when we travel outside these borders, we do um, contain that kind of privilege. And, and at the same time, I know one of the artists that she was accused of plagiarizing, even with the spirit video, right? Um, I think that artist was also so someone who had collaborated on a music project with Solange. <laughs> so they're all in the same sphere. Uh, so it's a question of, so what does it mean to still exist in that space where everyone sees that you are in a position of exploitation? And I think that's always going to be the challenge. As much as we, you know, someone mentioned in the audience that as, you know, we all need to embrace everything about ourselves, whether we have blonde hair or locks or dark skin skin, light skin, big, you know, skinny, whatever. I mean, that's all well and good, but we also need to think about the power and the privilege that comes with that, because uh, I think um, a pop star like Beyonce, her fame, her beauty, her wealth is always going to be read as being less about solidarity and more about exploitation. And and how do we, how do we overcome that? Because that does color the way we look at how we're able to interact. Uh, so, Because I do think she comes from that space of solidarity, but then there are these ways where it then looks more like exploitation, not solidarity. And I think that always happens when we don't think of what is our power and what is our privilege when we come to, you know, to this space. And, and real quickly, because I know we're trying to be conscious for time and it's time to wrap up, but um, hopefully my comment attends to um, the, the two comments and yours in the back um, as well. To piggyback off of what you said, Janelle, I think you know one of the ways that we can perhaps, notwithstanding the gaze, right, and our consciousness that we know that however we're performing in these spaces, people are looking to us and imposing their frameworks, but I'm inspired by this notion around um, write and research what you know and experience. So when we're talking about you know, opportunities to transcend or to kind of create space, as you were saying, in terms of that, the, the tropes, if we in, if flood the area, the discourse, with our multiplicities of stories, our nuances, right? You can have these sisters that are in the same family, but they are representative of particular perspectives and voices. And I say that, and perhaps it's controversial because it comes at the heels of American dirt, where you have a person who claims to be talking about and identifying particular stories and claiming to be a part of the community in which she's not. And in fact, she's engaging in trauma fetishization. But if we have more of our stories where we can actually show the multiplicity of how we can embrace our own sexuality and enjoy sex without necessarily evoking Jezebel tropes or being the strong black woman in whatever spaces without being angry, right? If we tell our stories, perhaps that's one opportunity um, to be able to address that, to say we are full people and we're complex and love us all, always. Thank you all so much. Can everyone give a